Hello everyone. Welcome to our webinar on navigating the future of code signing, CAP Forum and HSMs for 2024. My name is Surbhi. I'm the senior marketing consultant with Encryption Consulting. We also have with us John and Jamie. We'll hold for another minute so we can allow other attendees to join. I see a few coming in, so please give us another minute. We will kick off shortly. Hello everyone, welcome to Navigating the Future of Code Signing, CAP Forum and HSMs for 2024. I want to thank everyone for joining in. I hope you are all doing great. My name is Surbhi. I am the Marketing Consultant with Encryption Consulting. Today we have John with Securisys and Jamie from Encryption Consulting. Just want to give you a quick overview of Encryption Consulting before handing it over to John. Encryption Consulting is an established data protection consulting market leader. We focus on the areas of PKI, HSM, encryption, code signing, and post-quantum cryptography. More than 100 corporations of the Fortune 500 have sought our help in protecting their sensitive data and solving the most complex problems. We are considered one of the leaders in consulting, planning, and advising of product selection and implementation. Now, I'm happy to introduce our speaker, John. John is a result-driven executive with over 25 years of extensive experience in developing and supporting successful projects and solutions, incorporating a diverse range of applications, environment, and technologies. He is a visionary and a passionate leader with a solid history of innovation and success in leading design and implementation of technologies, creating and optimizing client internal-facing applications and designing technology tools to generate competitive advantages and drive strategic business growth. Now, a little about Securisys. Securisys is a renowned industry leader specializing in cybersecurity, encryption, and digital identity protection. Trusted by over half of the world's tier one banks, the company provides HSMs developed and manufactured in Switzerland. Securisys comprehensive HSM solutions available for both on-premises and cloud deployment are certified to the highest security standards, including FIPS and common criteria. A, a brief overview on our consultant, Jamie. He has been a consultant with Encryption Consulting. Jamie focuses on the development of CodeSign Secure and works involving G HSMs. Jamie has knowledge and experience working with customers to integrate a variety of HSMs into solutions such as PKI and code signing. Now I will give you a brief overview of today's agenda. First, let's start with an overview on what is code signing and the CAP browser forum and requirements on it. Next, we will talk about the impact of HSM on code signing process, as well as introduction to HSMs and its various type. Meanwhile, we will also discuss how code signing integrates with your organization's CI-CD pipeline. Next, we will discuss code signing measures to be implemented by organizations as requested by GAP Forum. Then we will discuss on the code signing process and introduce our flagship product, CodeSign Secure. And finally, we will look into the various options of HSMs available by Securisys, the recommendations they provide, and the HSM options your organization can choose from. Now I will hand it over to John. Uh, many thank you, Sylvie, for the introduction and welcome everybody in today's webinar. Uh, I would like to start with a brief introduction on what code signing is, and Jamie will then later on dive into some more of the specific details. But today's world, if we download software from the internet, we want to make sure that the software that we download from a website or a company that we trust and that is not coming from a malicious third party. And with a resource like code signing, we can assure that the software that is coming from a proper source. So we can basically avoid and double check that it's coming from a company that says it's delivering the software and it's not coming from a malicious third party. And that allows users like you and us, to download software that's malicious and check that the software is coming from the right party. 
And we can do that with public key, public key and private keys. So typically if a user or a software distributor is deploying software, he will sign it with a private key. So he digitally signs the software before he sends it out to the customer. And a user which will download the software, he will use the public key that's provided along with the software to double check that's coming from the originator. So it's coming from the content creator, which has said to be doing the software what it's doing. So the digital signature that's provided on the code on, on the software, binary that shape, that signs and acts as a proof that the code code hasn't been tampered to it or has been modified from its original form. Now with the ability to download so much software from the internet, code signing is really becoming important. Uh, we just want to avoid that we download malicious software. We will probably all recognize that because we have been looking on the internet for certain tools, probably want to have a combination with the term free and we all end up with quite questionable software packages that we can download. So code signing helps us to assure that's coming from the right source. So it's coming from a company like Adobe. And it's not that we are finding and trying to download a robot reader for free from a malicious site that's not Adobe, for example. So what happens if we download software that's code signed on the computer? The typical operating system will check the digital certificate along with the code that it matches with each other. And if the code signing certificate matches with the signed code, it will then install it typically on your laptop or server. If there was a mismatch, you will get alerted and informed that there is a mismatch, and then you can decide whether you want to install that or rather skip it. This is not only on servers or laptops, but it's also found in the IoT domain or the automotive domain, where we want to avoid that malicious software is installed on these devices and in the end, they get compromised. So code signing has basically many benefits. So with code signing, users can trust that the software that they are downloading, and they don't need to worry about downloading malware onto their computer or mobile devices. It's a big issue. We all know the Apple stores, we know all the Google Play stores, and they demand that the software that's being shared by those platforms is signed by the developers. And that brings us to the point that, you know, these platforms allow customers and developers, manufacturers of software to share the software to a larger audience. But it's not only those commercial package software that's distributed and needs to be code signed. It's also other packages. Think about Docker images that we want to install into our network or on servers. It's about Java files that need to be code signed. It's about Windows applications that we download from you know, Microsoft or Microsoft installer files running on a Windows, um, Windows machine or from a third party. But also if we deploy Excel macros or Visual Basic object files in macros in Excel, they want to be trusted. So we don't get malicious code there running on our system if we install Excel microfiles, for example. Also signing firmware updates, updates that are being deployed on IoT devices. All these cases, we want to make sure that we don't install malicious software onto our devices. And that's why we want to make sure that the source they are coming from is verified and proved. So basically, we can conclude that code signing is being used by everyone nowadays. And whether that's now internally where people use Excel micros or whether it's a company delivering software to external clients or customers. So when we talk about code signing, uh, we, we need a code signing certificate. And these are typically issued by trusted certified or uh, trusted 
certification authorities, things like uh, companies like Sectico, Komodo, DigiCert. And it used to be the case that uh, you could easily obtain folks signing certificates and you could install them simple on your server or on your laptop. Uh, changes have been made last year and uh, these changes basically affect how certificates are being issued. So if we talk about code signing, um, these are issued as mentioned before by those certificate authorities, but there are rules in place there. So for the issuing of these code signing certificates, there are guidelines defined by the certification and authority browser forum, also known as the CUP forum. And the CUP forum is a consortium of certification authorities, uh, vendors of internet browsers and other PKI enabled application that define industry guidelines covering uh, the issuing and management of digital certificates and that shape basically back to a trust paper in these devices. So these guidelines cover, amongst others, uh, certificates for, for TLS connections to websites, but also the code signing certificates. And last year, there was a big change um, when the Cup Browser Forum uh, updated its regulations for code signing certificates and services. And the intention of the new regulation here is that to reduce basically the potential misuse of code signing certificates and to further protect certificates from getting compromised and, and in, the, in the wrong hands. And incorporated means that as of June 1st last year, standards require that private keys for code signing certificates must be stored on hardware. That's either certified as FIPS 140-2 level two as a minimum or common criteria EIL or plus certified or any other equivalent solution. So before this date, it was best practice to store these code signing certificates on a hardware token or a HSM, but you could deviate from it, just store the certificate on a, on a laptop or a server. Now it's a mandatory requirement, and therefore you cannot obtain any longer certificates that are simply way stored on the server. So what does this mean? So this new requirement has certain effects for you as an end user which is doing code signing. And the first effect uh, aspect is basically uh, where do we store my private key and certificate. So this new requirement means that certificate authorities can no longer support browser-based e-generation and certificate installation. And that includes creating basically a certificate signing request and storing your certificate on a laptop or server. So that's no longer possible. That means that private keys and certificates for code signing purposes must be installed, must be stored and installed on tokens or hardware security modules that are certified at at least as FIPS 140-2 level two or common criteria ELL 4 plus. The second aspect is that uh, with regards to the signing the code. So in order to sign code, you need to use that token-based code signing certificate. So you either need to insert that token or HSM in your laptop or server, in order to access your signing certificate. And the second point is that you need credentials to log into that token where the certificate is stored. So in practice, you must plus that token into your computer for token-based code signing or connect to a HSM if in case you use a HSM. And then you authenticate against the HSM or the token with a password in order to be able to sign the code. Third aspect that it has is that for ordering and renewing code signing certificates, 
So when you order or renew a code signing certificate, you must now select a provisioning method. And that means you must choose the hardware to store the private key on. So typically there are a few options there. Uh, typically uh, uh, a CA will provide you with a simple hardware token that could be a smart card. The other option is that you say, okay, I have my own token in which I want to install my certificate and generate the key. Or the third option is that you use a hardware security module. Again, hardware tokens and the HSNs must meet the FIPS and common criteria standards there. The final aspect that it has impact on is when code signing certificates are reissued. So in case you lost your certificate and you want to have it reissued, it must now be installed on the supported hardware. So that brings me to the question, what is exactly a hardware security module? So a hardware security module is um, a device that generates high quality keys. It protects them from logical and physical attacks and uses these keys to perform cryptographic operations within a secure environment that's been offered by the HSM. So instead of storing cryptographic keys and plain text on the laptop or the server, you now store them on a HSM where they are securely locked away from all outside threats. So even if your network is hacked or your files have been accessed, the most important information that, that is your keys, your certificates or digital identities are protected inside a HSM from bad actors. So we can view a HSM as a digital data vault. It offers secure storage for cryptographic keys. Uh, it offers controlled and reg regulated access to these keys. That means I have, there is a protocol in place or a policy in place in order to access these keys. Uh, it supports a variety of cryptographic algorithms and it offers a tamper proof, fail safe, and redundant environment in the end. So, just let us have a quick look on the different form factors for HSMs and tokens that are out there and that might be suited for code signing. So first of all, we have the smart card HSMs, and these are basically smart cards that we all know, and the typical use cases for these smart cards are authentication and access control. So we see them in governmental, in financial and healthcare applications, and where they basically use authentication. But you can use these also to have a key generated and to do a signing operation with it. So the drawback of this card is basically that they offer really limited functionality in terms of storage capacity, the algorithms that are supported, and in the end, the, the signing performed or the cryptographic performance of these devices. Also, something that we need to take into account is that these smart cards need to be installed in the card reader. And if we take a, a build environment into account, where we have maybe multiple build servers, or we have virtualized build servers nowadays, this becomes an issue because it's difficult to integrate a smart calculator, route everything through to a virtualized environment, and then especially deal with multiple build servers. Second option is a USB HSM, and these are small portable HSMs designed to connect to a USB port. Might be ideal for a developer who only needs to sign something one of the month or once every half a year. That's a cost effective solution. But if you want more flexibility, uh, it offers a bit more flexibility than the smart card. However, we still face the same issues and difficulties when it comes to integration and, and scalability, as we saw with the smart card readers there. Third variant is the network HSMs, and basically they resolve the shortcomings that we saw with uh, the smart card readers and the USB devices. So network HSMs typically provide high-level and uh, high-speed access to cryptographic operations, 
and they can be addressed through the network. And these are typically used by organizations where high performance and scalability is required and where you might have multiple servers having access or need access to a HSM. Additionally, they can be managed remotely. Uh, you know, there are advanced algorithms there. Uh, you have advanced administration and management capabilities. And these are typically things that are not found on USB or smart cards. Last variant I want to cover are uh, cloud based HSMs, and they are basically hosted in the cloud and are accessible over the internet. We see a trend the last few years that these are getting used more and more. Um, they can be in existing cloud service providers. We also see a trend that people want to have a HSM outside of the existing main cloud service providers like AWS, Azure, and Google. So they want to be independent there. And these solutions basically are based on the network HSM we've seen before, but having this as a service or even as a managed service is interesting for companies because they don't need to upfront investment in equipment, they just pay for, for what they need. Other variants are there. I mean, we have the payment HSMs, but they are not relevant for code signing. And we also have solutions based around PCI card HSMs. So it's a PCI card that I put into a server. Uh, first hand glance, you might think they are ideal for, for code signing, but especially if we talk about code signing, having multiple um, build servers within a company, having virtualized build service, you still realize that a PCI card HSM will not work there, especially because they are typically only accessible by the applications running on that server. So if you start running software on multiple build servers, you soon realize that you need in every server a PCI card or an HSM. So let me finish with a quick recap. So in the case uh, we didn't follow the best practice and store the signing key on the, on the HSM, it's, it's likely that the signing key is stored simple on the build server itself, uh, where it's accessible to possible intruder or any, uh, anyone else with bad uh, intentions. And that is exactly what the, the cup browser form intends to resolve with the new regulation that was announced last year. Now, if we widen our view and look further into you know, what's around in our company, uh, we see that there's not only a build server, but there are also other applications that handle sensitive information and might use of cryptographic key material. Uh, there might be databases in the company that are encrypted with an encryption key, for example. There might be workstations around. We might have servers running in the company that are, for example, uh, using uh, are being used for a PKI that's being deployed in the company. Again, there is cryptographic material. And the good advantage of using an HSM is that these HSMs are typically multi-tenant. So instead of just using an HSM for a code signing purpose, I can store all my sensitive material on this HSM. Just avoid the risk that my database server is compromised where the key for the actual encryption is still on the server. I can migrate this. I can resolve these issues by migrating these keys to a hardware security module. So in that case, if my database is compromised or even the whole server is compromised, the key to decrypt the data is no longer there on the server. It's not there on a backup. It's in the HSM where it's protected. So with that, I would like to hand over the presentation to Jamie, and Jamie will go more in detail about integration of code signing into a CD, CD pipeline and using a, an HSM. 
And afterwards, I will have a closer look on selection criteria and recommendations when it comes to selecting and using a HSM. Hi, everyone. Thank you for that, John. I'm going to start presenting here in just a moment. So when you have a CICD pipeline, you now need to integrate code signing into that CICD pipeline in order to proceed. Uh, as without code signing, your finished builds will not be able to go live or into, in some cases, even testing, depending on your organization's policies, without being signed. So to continue receiving the benefits of a CICD pipeline's expedited process, implementing code signing is a good idea and potentially best practices. So when you have code an HSM attached to your CICD pipeline, you're able to quickly sign code securely without having in the past, like you may have, your code signing keys on the build server. As we've kind of already discussed, having your code signing keys on the build server means that if someone gains access to your build server or a compromise or leak happens to your network, that someone can use those code signing keys and impersonate your organization. So the CAB form rules now say that you need to have an HSM to get a code signing key. Without this, you will not be able to continue to acquire code signing keys from the CAs that are offering them. And you need to be able to prove that you have this HSM by showing the location of the keys, proving hardware. Uh, oftentimes they'll request a picture of the physical HSM, as well as the firmware version, software version to make sure that you are conforming with these requirements, including that you're at FIPS level two device. So let's briefly run over how code signing works for those of you uninitiated. Uh, if you don't yet use code signing, we strongly recommend that it's something that you implement because without code signing, when a user receives your, your code, they will not be able to verify the integrity of the code. For example, if a hacker has uh, infiltrated your download location, they could put a separate file up that pretends to be the file that the user was going to download. Uh, and the user would download it and believe that it came from your organization. Uh, trusting it, installing it, potentially turning their machine into a bot or introducing a Trojan or keylogger. But if you sign your code every time, they will have the comfort and expectation that when they receive code from you, it will be signed. So Windows will pop up that little prompt telling them this was signed by this publisher on this state. In addition, Windows will automatically do checking for any sort of executable installer to make sure that no tampering has occurred on the code. If tampering has occurred, that prompt will not show your publisher information. It will let the user know that this code has been modified since it's signing. So when a user wants to sign code, they're going to submit a CSR to a CA. That CA will verify the identity of the publisher and they'll verify that you have an HSM. They will ask you a variety of questions and they will usually ask you for pictures at this point. Once they authenticate that you are who you say you are, you have the required hardware to host the code signing key, they will fulfill your CL CSR and sign it, allowing you to use your generated code signing certificate. So, we mentioned briefly a set moment ago that there is a way that Windows and users can verify the integrity of your code. When you sign a piece of code, we create a hash first. And with that hash, we will then sign with the private key. This allows the private key to remain inside the HSM and your code to remain on your machine. This means there's no way for an attacker to intercept any meaningful data. So your code 
won't be stolen in transit to a cloud HSM. And likewise, your private key will never be exposed. So your hash code goes to the HSM, is signed by this approved certificate that proves your identity to any user. And the signed hash is bundled with that original certificate, the original hash at the end of the code. Windows knows how to process this already, and so do other competing operating systems like Linux and Mac. There are various schemas, all of them universally compatible. And you will be able to verify that the code is not been tampered with by comparing this hash to the signed hash. This hash will be generated by the machine when it goes to run the code to compare. So why should you implement code signing if you haven't already? First, it establishes trust in the application or the update to the application. It proves to the user that they can trust this file. It also will allow you to operate in various app stores. Many distributors of software expect and require you to have code signing. Uh, if you haven't run into it already, you will run into it soon. It'll allow you to validate your identity as an organization and establish trust in your organization. Uh, you can't get a code signing certificate if you have absolutely no reputation and you cannot prove that you are a legitimate business, meaning that anyone with a code signing certificate is far more trustworthy than a random download on a suspicious website. So there are a few issues with code signing at its base that mandate the need for an HSM, regardless of what the CA browser was saying. So even if you are able to put this off for a couple more months or a year, it's best to implement it now because without an HSM, your keys will not be securely stored uh, and you are likely to run into issues stemming from that. Past the requirement for an HSM, there are other issues that you might face with code signing. Uh, just because you've signed a file doesn't mean you know which person in your organization signed that file. This can lead to problems if you have bad actors within your organization, especially as you're scaling to larger and larger organizations. There comes times when it's important to track who did what. So having a universal bundled utility that assists you with code signing tracks who does what, when they do it, what they are signing, with which of your certificates they are using, can go a long way to establishing uh, an audit trail within your organization. So if a malicious actor acts, you will be able to figure out who it was, when they did it, and from what machine they've done it. So the biggest issues you're going to run into with code signing are issues stemming from users misusing your certificates or your certificates becoming compromised or your keys becoming compromised. So your certificate is a public key. Anyone can have access to that. You don't need to keep it secure. But the private key that usually now exists in the HSM or in the past maybe existed on a build server if that were to get compromised, you would run into the ability for people to forge your updates, which would allow any user to pretend to be you. So if you're doing code signing, you need an HSM in order to protect your identity. I'm going to quickly uh, pitch our solution. So code, uh, encrypt, encryption consulting provides code sign secure a integrated code signing solution that allows you to work with your HSM, for example, our partner Securosys is Primus HSM, and centrally access all of those keys remotely via proxy access in order to do your signing operations. Uh, by having everything routed through a central build server, 
sorry, sorry, a, a central code signing server, your individual build servers can all access the HSM through that code signing server, which is what code sign secure supports. Meaning all of the events, signing events, key creation can be managed from one central application. Uh, this can help uh, simplify workflows, but it also allows you to directly integrate with your existing tools, such as your existing CIC pipelines. Instead of having to do the engineering work yourself to integrate with an HSM, our solution does all of that work for you in addition to providing valuable tracking and auditing tools. It can also integrate with your existing multi-factor authentication or user management tools. So if you're using um, Microsoft's authentication tools to log into your company, you can use those same tools to prove your identity to code sign secure. We also offer built-in malware and virus scaling so that if you are trying to, if a user is trying to upload malicious code and sign it with your certificate, a malicious internal user, it will be stopped and the server will refuse to sign that file. So Code Sign Secure uses the earlier mentioned hash-based code signing to collect the hash from the signing user and send it to the signing server. The signing server will scan the code, verify that there is no malware, and make a decision whether the user trying to do the signing is in fact authorized to do the signing. So if you've decided that said user is no longer part of your organization and should not have access to your signing certificate, but have yet to successfully terminate their accounts, you can simply turn off their access through Code Sign Secure. So this middle point allows you to remotely manage the access of multiple build servers, users, and clients. Once you have gotten the approval from the server, it will pass to the HSM a request for signing and then pass that signing request back to the final machine where it will be bundled into that final signed program. Keys never leave the HSM and code never leaves your machine. This offers the best protection for your assets and your security keys. In addition, Code Sign Secure has done the footwork in order to make sure that when you go about signing, you don't have to use new tools or new commands. We integrate directly with Microsoft Sign Tool. We integrate directly with Jar Signer and many other utilities that are industry standard throughout the market. So you won't have to learn new tools or invest in training. You will just be able to use what you've always used in order to complete your code signing. Code Sign Secure enables the signing of committed changes submitted to resource repositories such as GitHub. So because it integrates directly with your CICD pipeline, you can have your CICD tools that you already use, maybe Jenkins or Azure DevOps, and have as a process in the build, signing the file at the end if all other test cases pass. This enables you to have a direct build to release process where you could then have, after the signing occurs, a process to upload it to some centrally available repository or website. It will also log this. So if someone were to misuse this process, you would know who had done it. Let's talk briefly about deployment options. Code Sign Secure is made to work with what your organization needs. So if you have your own data center, you already have HSMs, Code Sign Secure will be able to work on premises in your data center just like that. If you know, don't have an HSM, but you do have a data center and you don't want the work of and hassle of maintaining an HSM, you can use Code Sign Secure on premise, but with a cloud HSM. We also offer an entirely remotely hosted option in our system as a service model, where you will pay a simple annual subscription 
and gain access to a bit a code signing server to do all of the work for code signing and an HSM. So if you are an organization that strongly has policies that you must keep your keys on premises, we can accommodate you. And if you are an organization that wants to have as little of your hand in the process as possible, we can do a system as a service model. If you're somewhere in the middle, we can reach you where you are at. I'm going to turn it back over to John now. Thank you guys for your time. Thank you, JB. Let me go back to my screen. So, again, thank you, JB. Um, if you want uh, to use a HSM, uh, if, in case you don't have a HSM yet, and your, your target is for code signing for an integration there, or even use a HSM for along with all applications in your organizations, think about the PKI, uh, Identity Access Management System. What are the topics or the aspects that you need to consider uh, if we look for a HSM? So, First of all, we have the technical factors uh, that we need to take into account. It's about performance. How many signing or cryptographic operations do you want to execute? Uh, do we talk about one operation per day, per hour, or do we talk about in the end of 100 uh, signing operations per minute or per second? So that will be a factor that we need to take into account if we look for a HSM. Also, scalability, how many keys do we want to store on the HSM? Can I grow in the future if I need a higher performance or more storage capacity? What about redundancy? Uh, typically, uh, HSMs are deployed in a fair over high availability configuration in order to deal with network outages. And uh, does your support the HSM that? Also a question there is, how do I synchronize key material between HSMs in a cluster? Do we need to go to a physical HSM, make a backup of the key and restore that in another HSM? Or does a HSM cluster do that automatically for you? What about the backup process? Is that convenient? Is it possible to make a backup and restore it in case of a disaster? Then, of course, we have the APIs. The APIs with HSMs are typically standardized. And depending on your application that you will use and integrate with, it will be either a PPC 11 interface, a Microsoft CNG, or a Java interface, or maybe nowadays also a REST API that it's required for integration. Is it just an integration with code sign secure? It's pretty straightforward, but do you also consider using different applications within your organization with the HSMs? Uh, we have to check that all the APIs are covered there. Does the product need certification? FIPS and common criteria are typically the most common certifications in the HSM domain. Uh, but do you need both of them? Are they required? or to the in the end, it, it's not required because it's too restrictive for you. So these are topics you need to consider there as well. Other factors that we need to take into account is basically uh, ease of maintenance, uh, which hardware operating system I'm using, which operating system am I using? Is it Linux, is it Windows, or is it something that's uh, it's a Windows that's version that's already 10 years old. So make sure that you know that uh, what operating system and hardware that you're going to use works with the HSM. What management requirements do you have? Uh, do we want to be able to remotely manage the HSM because I have physical boxes deployed in the data center and I don't want to go there every now and then when it's required? or just do you want to do it remotely? Which algorithms or cryptographic algorithms are relevant for you? Can they be upgraded in the future? Something to consider, as well as the authentication options that are provided by the HSM. That means, 
do you want to have a username and password for authentication or do you want to have something like a multi-factor authentication where you authenticate with a smart card and a pin code on the smart card so two-factor authentication for the administration of your hsm talking about policy options we want to be able to configure each partition on a device separately. Do you want to put restrictions in place for certain operations? Do you want to create keys that can be used only for signing purpose or signing and encryptions? Is that possible or not? Also, the audit capabilities, as mentioned by Jamie, you want to be able to lock and see what has happened on the HSM, so who signed what at a certain time. That can be relevant for all the compliance reasons later on. What kind of a deployment are you after? Do you want on-premise devices where you have an upfront cost investment, or do you want to go for ease and convenience and go into the cloud and where you pay for what you get? Also in the cloud, what do you want in the cloud? Do you just want to have a HSM there that you need to manage yourself? Or is it a managed solution where it's taking care of for firmware updates, for the uptime it's guaranteed, et cetera? That means if you go for on-prem devices or self-managed devices in the cloud, you need to have the people on board that are trying to operate the HSM. You should go for managed solution, for example, you can skip this because it's taken care of for you. What about scalability on-prem and in the cloud? Can I migrate from an on-prem device to a cloud solution or back downwards again? Can I scale in the cloud? That means can I have more storage capacity because I need more keys or I need a higher performance? Is it feasible? Jamie talked about uh, making pictures of your HSM to prove to a certification authority that your own HSMs. Well, HSMs nowadays have key and device attestation capabilities. That means there's a cryptographic proof that you provide to a certification authority or even an auditor that a key was cryptographically generated on a HSM. It wasn't imported and it was never expected. That makes the whole process around obtaining code signing certificates a lot easier. How fast do you want to be up and running? It comes with product training and cost optimizations as well. So do we go for on-prem devices? I need to order them, I need to install them, I need to train the people. Or do we go for a cloud, for example, where we can have a system up and running tomorrow? All the factors that we take into account is its integration support. Are the applications that you want to use supported by the HSM vendor? What options are there for doing pre-integration or pre properties best development work and training and support? So I want to finish off now with a few slides um, on the solutions that Securus offers. Uh, just a high level overview, quick lens there. Uh, Securus offers basically on-premise HSMs as well as a managed solution for cloud HSM in the cloud. Uh, let's first look on the on-premise solutions. So we have basically offer two different platforms. It's an X and E series. And from a functional perspective, they are nearly identical. But the only difference is, is that the E series is a more economical platform that doesn't offer integrated smart card slot for authentication. And the X series is a higher performance platform that comes with integrated smart card slots for integration. So both platforms are scalable in the sense that we can have multiple partitions there and we can also have a higher performance or cryptographic number of operations that can be performed on both platforms. So you can scale there when you need to grow. Both product lines are BIPs and CC certified and they come with all the standardized APIs available 
P11, you have Microsoft CNG, you have Java interface, and we even offer a REST API. Key storage for signing operations, it's plenty there. We have partitions standard with 240 megabyte in the X series, and there's a total storage capacity on other projects of around 30 gigabyte. So not relevant typically for code signing solutions, but you might have other needs that where you can use IGSM there and where this can come in necessary. Again, the system is multi-tenant. That means we can slice basically up the devices and offer multiple partitions on these devices. And what this means is that you can have one partition where you store your code signing key for production environment. You can have another partition on the HSL where you have your uh, code signing key that's used for internal release test, for example. Uh, you can use another partition for your, your company PKI. So you can separate key material from and assign it to different users. So a PKI will not have access to your code signing keys and the other way around. Other things worth mentioning is that the, the HSMs can be clustered and they will synchronize the key material automatically once configured in a cluster. That means you don't have to go to a HSM after you added a new key make a backup, go to another HSM in a different data center and restore that key on that device. These devices can be clustered in such a way that if you create a new key on one device or you delete the key from the device, it propagates from the cluster and all the devices will synchronize them again. We have four network ports on the back and that allows users to separate cryptographic data from management data and from crystal synchronization, as well as have the option there to use ports for redundancy and failover purposes. We have basically two-factor authentication with the smart cards. We also have a policy or a program implemented for the security officers. So we can say we have two out of three or four administrators or security officers defined that need to be present or log into the device in order to administer it. Administration and management can be done in front of the device, but it can also be done remotely with the database terminal. And with the database terminal, you have the capability to manage the device completely remotely, whether that's more than new users, deploying firmware updates, it can be done all remotely. So the products we see here on this slide, uh, they are also used in our cloud environment. And there we use the capability to partition our devices to offer a cost-effective solution to our customers. And what we do there, we offer is a managed solution that's geo-redundant deployed. And that means that we have a cluster of HSMs across different data centers. So we have one data center on location X, we have another one Y, and we have a third one on Z. And the HSMs in those data centers are configured to operate in the cluster and they are partitioned. So this offers you as a user the advantage that if the connection to one data center is down, you can fall back to another data center. So we have a guaranteed uptime that's almost 100% there. By partitioning the HSMs, we are able to have more multiple users on one physical device. And whether you use that for PKI, for code signing purposes, or identity access management, that can all be flexible configured. So it's a managed solution. We take care of the uptime. We take care of the security for the onboarding, for firmware updates, et cetera, monitoring the system, you as a user only do your cryptographic integration with your application, we will support you. And that means you don't have to worry and teach your people or educate people within your company to manage the HSMs on-prem yourself. 
are different flavors of this solution. So we have a general purpose cluster urban running. We also have a cluster that's common criteria certified, typically used for people customers that do uh, document signing and constant uh, regulations. But we also see that customers use this, for example, for code signing as well. Besides that, we have a development environment or sandbox, as we call it, that allows you to do easy integration tests. So it's a scaled down system in that case, where you can do pre-production runs, you can do integration tests without going through a production system or the HSMs itself. So you can easily separate that. So where are we around the world? We have uh, data centers in the East and the West Coast of America. We have data centers in, in Europe, in Germany and Switzerland. We have a data center in Singapore. And Japan is on uh, the list of data centers to be added. And that allows us basically to, to offer uh, a geographic solution or even a worldwide cluster. So typically customers in the US, we can onboard them on the data centers we have in the US. So in case you, you made a data center that you connect for your hydrogen solution is in the East, there's an interruption there, you can fade over to the West. But we also have customers that want to have a worldwide cluster because they have uh, offices in the East, in Europe and in the West coast on America and by setting up their cluster, customers within the respective regions can simply connect to the HSM in that region. So we have short connection times there as well. So with that, I want to basically hand back to the presentation to, to Serbi. And let's see if we have any questions that we can answer. Uh, John and Jamie, thank you for that in-depth presentation. We would love to engage with you all in some Q&A, thoughts and observations. I do see a few questions from the audience, so let's dive in for our Q&A. Remember, if you have any questions, be sure to use the Q&A panel. So the first question that I can see right now is, which HSM setup would you recommend for a CI-CD pipeline? And that question is addressed to me or Jamie, sorry. Uh, that question is for you. So the question is, which HSM do I recommend for uh, a CID pipeline? Uh, good question. Where is your CID pipeline located? Do you have an on-premise, uh, in case you have an on-premise solution, it's worth looking into on-prem devices for HSMs, but you also can combine it with a, a cloud solution. So in that case, you will save time and, and uh, on, on educating people to use the HSM by simply hooking it up to a cloud HSM partition. It could be a very attractive solution. If you see a CD pipeline is already in the cloud, it makes sense to connect directly to a cloud HSM solution, I would say. Great. Uh, moving to the next question, it is that, is there a migration path possible between on-premise devices and HSMs in the cloud? Could you please repeat your question, sorry? Uh, sure. Is there a migration path possible between on-premise devices and HSMs in the cloud? Okay, so you can migrate between cloud and on-prem. So what we can do is if you are using the system on-prem, for example, we can make a backup of the key material on a partition and migrate that partition to a cloud solution. Uh, the other way around is also possible if you say, okay, I'll start in the cloud. Uh, and then you discuss and find out that in the end, it's more effective for you or better to use on-premise devices we can also assist there and make a backup of your partition. You can even do it yourself with the Dracodus terminal, and then you can restore that backup onto an on-prem device. So yes, we can migrate key material between on-premise devices and a cloud solution. 
Great. We also have another question, uh, which is, if I don't have the expertise in-house to maintain an on-site HSM, and if I choose to have a cloud HSM set up, can I have some remote control of, of my clusters and my keys? You can, if we have a solution in the with cloud HSM, it's partition based, but we also have uh, dedicated machines. Uh, I didn't touch upon that in the cloud. But in both cases, you as an end user can choose to opt uh, to manage your own partition. And you can do that with a vacuum installer. And if you have a device in the cloud, what you can do then on the partition is you can make a backup of your key material yourself, but you can also change the configuration parameters of your partition. For example, you can restrict the import or export of key material. You can select which APIs that's being used. Uh, you can issue yourself, you set up passwords, etc. Great. We have another follow-up question, which is any comments of key attestation methods and emerging standards in that area? So I think with key attestation, we we see a lot of requests for that, uh, and it started basically a year or two, three ago with the whole corona pandemic. So typically, um, if we take a, a PGI, for example, as a use case, uh, there's a root ceremony where a lot of people need to come together, and that was you know, practical in corona time. So what key distillation allows you is that you, as an administrator or a user of a petition, you can create your root key or any other key. And with key attestation, you can prove to an auditor or certification authority that the key was generated according to a certain process. On the HSM, the key was not imported and the key was now extracted from the HSM. And we are able to do that because we have a, a root certificate that secures this. The devices will have a device certificate that's signed by the root certificate by secures And on each partition, again, there's a key for, for signing purposes. So that we are able to offer a complete chain back to the root of securities that proves that key were generated on a HSM. And you can take that also then to um, certification authority uh, in order to issue a certificate or a signing key, signing uh, request. Uh, we have a lot of customers, for example, that need and use this facility for document signing, for example. Uh, they need to issue uh, listed EI certificates that need to be deployed on the HSM. And we can provide them by this way proof to the TSP first service provider that a key is generated on the HSM. Amazing. So we have one more question, uh, which is for you, John. Uh, it's you mentioned using redundant HSMs in the cloud. Can I have them in multiple locations globally to allow for code signing internationally? Yes, we can have HSMs in different data centers and they can be synchronized or kept in sync by high availability uh, mechanisms. So I can set up a cluster of HSMs across different data centers. As long as there is an IP connection between those data centers, I can configure the HSMs across those data centers. And then it doesn't mean matter for my signing application to which HSM I connect. Typically on the on the code sign solution that Jamie presented, there's a configuration file. And in the configuration file, I basically list the IP addresses of the HSMs in my cluster. So in case my HSM in data center one cannot be reached, the application or the cryptographic provider in this case will fall back to another HSM and they can even prioritize that. So if my cluster has three HSMs in there, it will first pick HSM one. If it's not there, it will fall over to HSM two or even HSM three. And I'm free to configure that 
even with the priorities in place. So the cannabis co-signing solution there, I mean, and your co-signing solution, you probably want to make that redundant as well, or you probably have two instances instead of. And for the HSM, it doesn't really matter. It's multi tenant, so it can receive requests from a code signing server one, which is based, for example, in the US, and you have a team in Europe, they can connect to that same HSM cluster. Amazing. We have another question, which is a follow up question. Uh, how is the attestation conveyed to the CA? I'm just looking at the question because I see it here on my screen. How is attestation conveyed to the CA? So, what we do is uh, you, as an end user of the HSM, you can retrieve an uh, attestation log from the HSM. So you log into the HSM, uh, you issue a comment, and it will give you a signed audit log. The signed audit log is uh, signed by the key from the HSM, which includes the certificate of your device, and it includes in the end a chain to the root certificate of Securisys. And the, root, uh, the certificate can be downloaded from our website. We have an integration guide or an application node described how this links together and how an end user or a TSP or CA can quickly graphically verify that the key you, you are submitting for certificate signing request comes from a security device. All right, we have one more question, which is how does licensing work, usage, enterprise, or user-based? Is this with regards to HSM, or are we talking about code signing here? That's not clear to me. I think uh, we can just uh, keep it generic, talk about the HSM, and then if it's related to code signing, then uh, Jamie can pitch in and give his answer. So, so I explained we have two product lines. We have the E and the X series, and depending on your needs, uh, we can scale the system with regards to performance and the number of petitions or the storage space that you'll need. So, um, we, for example, we have an E20 device, and the E20 means we are able to do 20 cryptographic signings per second based on our SA4 KT. Um, that, that, that scales around 100 uh, or 120 RSA 2K signings per second. And if you need more, um, you know, reach out to us and we, we can upgrade you to uh, a product that is able to do faster. So that is just deploying a license file on the product. And that's the same with storage space. So basically what we typically discuss with the customers, what are the, the needs at the moment? What do they expect in the future? And based on that, we will decide, okay, is an E or X platform the better starting choice? But commonly the platform can grow with you. You don't need to invest in new hardware. It's a licensed product upgrade in the end. And there are no restrictions there on the connections that you will have on the HSMs. So that sounds great. Uh, I think these are all the questions that we have. Before we close, if you have any questions or you want to learn more about anything you heard, you can reach out to us at info at encryptionconsulting.com. Please be free to connect with us if you have any questions. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you, everyone.